Well, we're jumping into holiday season. Obviously, uh, last week you thought it was going to get to be fall, and then today it's going to be 80 degrees. So welcome to still longest summer ever in the world of summers. Uh, but this is uh, this season, usually around November, especially uh, you got an extra hour of sleep, and, and you, you start thinking about the holiday stuff, right? You start thinking about Thanksgiving coming up. And one of my favorite things about Thanksgiving is banana cream pie. Now, I'm a big banana cream pie fan. In fact, that's my favorite pie. But, but I don't like just any ordinary banana cream pie. Don't bring me your store-bought, you know, whatever it is. I, I have a specific one that, that my wife uh, started with my mother-in-law, but now, my, now that was going to sound really weird. Started as my mother-in-law, now as my wife? No. My mother-in-law used to make it for me. Now my wife makes it for me. Um, banana cream pie. And, and so I had to write down some of the instructions on how this goes. So it's, it begins with this secret uh, hand love crushed um, vanilla wafers and butter crust that's kind of put together, mashed together into the pie tin and then placed in the oven at exactly 353 degrees. Not 350, not 355, not 375, 353. It has to be that way, and it's there for about two minutes. During that time, they take out one of the, one of the secret ingredients is, is, a, is a brand new, fresh box of aged vanilla and banana pudding. They mix it together, and they put it together in this, in this in this exclusive Matsky bowl that, that is only at our house, and they put it inside there, and then they put only the freshest, most smoothest, whitest, creamiest milk wine. Aged just long enough, it's, it's milk, okay? And, and they just put it in there, and they mix it all together, and then they get out the bananas. And they slice each one of them at exactly a half an inch, no more, no less. And then they place those banana slices into one of the only that you can find most high-end Tupperware air-sealed tight containers, and they place that all in the refrigerator and let it just set for a little bit. Meanwhile, they've taken, they've, they've gotten out our exclusive only that you can find at Target oven mitts and pulled out the pie crust, and then they take all of that mixture of the banana cream and the filling and the bananas, and they mix it and put it into this pie tin, and then they cover it with this. The only way you can find it is if it's been aged in an air cylinder container of whipped cream and about two or three inches of it, and then they place it back in the refrigerator, uh, an aged refrigerator at that, and they make it, and they make it, and they leave it in there for a few hours, and then there's only one way to eat it. It, it, it's not good if, unless you eat it this way. You take it out and you never cut it. You can only use one of my exclusive Matsky dishwasher polished forks and it can only touch the pie and my lips and that's it. No one gets a piece. No, there's no cutting it. You just eat it straight from the tin. Now obviously, I'm exaggerating a little bit or a lot a bit about pie and, but, but there's something about the season we start thinking about that and, and really... The season isn't about what we eat, and it's not about just family getting together. It, in fact, sometimes it kind of feels more chaotic than a blessing, than encouraging. It feels more uh, difficult than it, than it should be. It's, it's not like, it's not as easy as pie. It's sometimes filled with hurt and difficulty and struggle. We, we look forward to getting together as a family, but we kind of don't. Some of us just want to get through this season as fast as we can, as soon as we can. We just want this over with. Because this month, we know we need to be grateful. And we're very grateful, and we're very thankful. And Thanksgiving Day, we are extremely thankful, and we gorge ourselves. And then Friday, Black Friday hits, and we're no longer thankful. We're greedy. And that's just the, that's the nature, the rhythm of the season. And then, then we hit the season where we're having to show up to people's houses and give them gifts, and we didn't even want to show up to their house, but they invited us. So we got to go get a gift, and now we're stressed about getting the gift. And oh, by the way, the kids have projects we got to do, and we got to do this, and we got to go there. We got to find the perfect gift for this family person. And it just becomes chaos. I think sometimes this part of the season, we just want peace and joy, and we hear it every Christmas. And yet we go, well, how do I get that? I don't ever feel that. It's, this is the least peaceful and the less, least joyful time for me and my family sometimes. 
For some of us, we love the season. We can't wait to start putting on our Christmas sweaters, ugly Christmas sweaters coming, and we, we think of all these things and we just look forward to all the glitz and all the, uh, we, we, don't like, we don't like the glitter, do we? No, we do not like glitter. But we, we look forward to all the lights and all that stuff, and Thanksgiving is just the process to get to there. But I wanna challenge us with something today that I think, I think sometimes we get the season mixed up because we mash it all together and we don't see how each part of this season leads into the next and sets the stage for the next. So here we go. It's the end of the holiday season or the, at the end of the holiday season. What do you want your, this year to look like? What do you want to appreciate the most? What do you want to get the most? How can you get the most out of this holiday season this year? Because honestly, for some of us, it feels like this, this is one of the years that we have the least to give. We are just completely exhausted. We're already tired. For some of us, we've, we've dealt with some pretty harsh stuff, some pretty difficult moments, and we're just trying to find peace for others of us, we just, we want to know what that joy looks like. We want to experience that joy. So how can I find joy-filled readiness for the new year to come when instead of feeling that melancholy exhaustion that I always feel on January 1st? Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to show you what God's Word has to say. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 because I think, I think sometimes what helps us through these, these times is actually stories, stories of individuals uh, who have, in, in the midst of circumstances, in the midst of difficulty, they seem to just, have you ever been around somebody that just has joy? You just kind of want to be around them. Like, they have no reason to be joyful. Their whole world's falling apart, and yet there's something about them that you just, there's a peace and a joy in them. What if we could have that kind of peace and joy coming up to this holiday season? What if we could have that kind of peace and joy coming into Thanksgiving and proceeding in through Christmas and after the first of the year? I think Paul was one of those people that had a unique ability. He, he had experienced the peace of God in a way that I, is unexplainable. I mean, think about this. We just finished, we're finished, we finished up the book of Colossians. And at the end of Colossians, almost at the end of, at the end of almost every single one of his letters, he shows real true gratitude towards people. There's something about being thankful that stirs in him, that, that causes him, causes something to well up inside of him that, that he just can't help but write, thank this person, and, and make sure you greet this person with the Holy Ghost, and make sure you, you appreciate this individual. This person was there for me when I needed it the most. I mean, he just expresses it over and over and over. You see, Paul's life wasn't easy. Every single letter that he wrote, he was either in chains and or in prison. It wasn't easy. His life was not easy. It was difficult. It was awful. And he's in these moments. And here's the thing about Paul. We've got to understand about his story. He's doing what God has called him to do. He is living out the will of God, and everything's falling apart. People are turning on him. People are rejecting him. Uh, he's, he's, he doesn't have any freedom. He knows that, that what's going to end is death. He's being tortured at times. He's being beaten. And yet he still finds peace. What were the ingredients of the peace that we see in Paul? Philippians chapter four. I wanna show you a few verses here, starting in verse four. We're gonna go through verse seven. I want you to, to see what Paul sees. These are the ingredients of peace that Paul has, all right? Here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. First off, what we see right away is he uses the word rejoice. Rejoice is, is a very interesting word. It, it, it contains the word joy in it, but rejoice means to re revel or continue to find joy in something. To revel or continue to find joy in something. Joy, biblically understood, is a basic and constant orientation of my, of, of my mind, of my focus. It's the fruit and internal evidence of a trusting relationship with God. Let me put it simply. True joy comes from an intentional realization of what God has done in the past, what he's doing now, and what he's doing in the future. And Paul, he's got it. And, and, and he says, and he tells these people, and, and the people in Philippi, the, people, the Philippians that he's writing to, they're not, they're not having easy street either. It's difficult. They're being persecuted for their faith. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just loving people and loving God, and they're, they're being rejected by society. 
And he says, he tells them, rejoice in the Lord. But then he uses another word, always. Paul has this brilliant way of being able to share something and not leave any loopholes. He doesn't say rejoice when it feels good, rejoice when it's easy, rejoice when things are going well. He doesn't even say rejoice when it's all going bad. He just says always. Always do it. Always find intention, intentional moments to, to rejoice. Rejoice always. And in case you didn't catch it, what he's calling us to do, he repeats himself. And he says he's going to repeat himself. I say it again, rejoice. Look what the next verse says. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Graciousness is a fancy word. It just basically means this. It means uh, grace-filled gratitude toward another. Grace-filled gratitude towards another. Towards God, towards other people, to, to the individuals you come in contact with, in fact, in case you didn't catch it, he said to who? Everyone. Again, directive. Not, not just your family members that you like, but also those family members you don't like. Not just the people that you see in the store and wave at and they wave back at you, but also the people that purposely ignore you when you look at them or try to hide down the other aisle. It's, it's not just the individual that it's easy to work alongside of and, and that's, your, that's, that's a good coworker. It's also that person that drives you nuts. Let your graciousness be made known to them. And in case you're struggling with all of this, how do I rejoice? How can I let my, my graciousness be made known? He reminds them. And it's kind of a little conjunction phrase. But he says, the Lord is near. So while you're wrestling with how do I rejoice and how do I, remember, the Spirit, we talked about this last week, the Spirit is in you. God is near. He's right with you. He understands what you're going through. He understands how much you don't like this individual. He understands how much this person drives you crazy. He understands that when Uncle Billy comes to the house, it's gonna drive everyone nuts and people are gonna flip out. He gets it. The Lord is near. And then he says another thing. Look at the next verse. Don't worry about anything. Because the Lord is near, here's the conjunction, because the Lord is near, we can rejoice and, and we, can, we can find joy in the circumstances and we can let our graces be made known and because the Lord is near, we don't have to worry about their response, how they're gonna react, what's gonna happen. We, we don't have to worry because God is near. So don't worry about anything, but in everything. Again, no loophole. Well, what do I need to, what do I need to focus on? What do I, wh what do I, what, what does it mean that the Lord is near, and, and what does it mean that I don't have to worry about anything? Well, in everything, every single thing you do. Look at the next verse. Or the rest of that. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here we see the first ingredient to experiencing peace and joy. The first ingredient is prayer, petition. We talk, you know, Charles talked about that. The prayer is such an important part of our lives. And here's the thing. I think sometimes we, we think of prayer as this weird kind of mumbling towards God moment. And if we don't know how to say it, we don't, we don't do it. Or when we're in a circumstance or a situation when everything's falling apart, we're like, God, help me. It's kind of like a quicksand moment, right? But here's the thing, prayer, prayer is best expressed through joy and gratitude. Prayer is just an expression, an overflow of the joy and gratitude that's inside of us that we appreciate what God has done and what he's doing for us and what he's planning on doing. Prayer is not an act of telling what God wa what we want. Prayer is this chain that's tethered to God. It's an anchor for our souls. It's something that ties us to God. It's communication between us and God. Prayer is a simple act of communicating with God the passions and confessions of your heart. I think in kind of an easy way to kind of think of prayer is prayer activates peace in our hearts. If you want to experience peace, it begins with prayer. The more that we pray, the more we focus on God, the more we, we appreciate God and, and show that gratitude towards God, the more our heart changes and we begin to see what God is doing. 
But he says to, with, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. You see, prayer, if prayer is just us praying to God, asking him for stuff, then he's just nothing more than a glorified genie in the bottle. We just want God to do something for us. Paul does not say, make sure God knows what you want. He says, if you want to experience peace, if you want to rejoice, if you want your graciousness to be made known to, to everyone, if you want to experience that the Lord is near, then pray. And, and offer up your petitions with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. That's the second ingredient. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's that, it's that ability to go, you know what, I don't feel like thanking you. You remember when your mom or dad told you you had to thank somebody and you really kind of didn't want to? Because they didn't really do much, but they said, no, you need to say thank you. Sometimes we've got to muster up the, all right, God, I, I don't see it right now, but I know, I know what you've done for me. Let, let me just make this really simple. Do you believe do you know that Jesus died on the cross for you? Start there. Start with just that fact and wrestle with that. That should lead to incredible gratitude because he saved us from ourselves and from our sin. And then he does something very interesting. Paul does something here. Look at this next part. Present your request to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what, what, what we want to experience? In the middle of chaos, in, in the Bible, the word peace is not an absence of war. It's not, it's not peace, uh, everyone, you know, peace out. You know, it's, it's not that. It's not a greeting. It's not a salutation. It's, it's not uh, avoidance of war or, or difficulty. Here's what it is. In the Hebrew culture, they understood that there was chaos. That, there were mo- that sin brought chaos to the world. And in the middle of all that chaos, God can give you peace. A stillness, a trust that God has got it all under control and, and it's going to be okay because the Lord is near. It's a beautiful picture and as Paul is painting this for us, he says that this peace which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds. When, when everything feels like chaos, when you feel like you can't get your thoughts straight, that peace will bring clarity, bring a stillness. May not give you the answers, may not even give you the answer you want, but there'll be something about it. If you've ever been around somebody who's experienced that peace, you get what I'm talking about. So how do we experience joy? Well, I think another story, another great story in the Bible is the story of David. If you ever have time, look at the story of David in the Old Testament. He, w- he wasn't a typical hero, at least at the beginning of his life. In fact, he was the one person nobody thought could be the hero. And, and, and in reality, David's life was a mess. He messed up a lot. He did a lot of things wrong. And yet, all throughout his life, God said, this is a man after my heart. How does that work? How can somebody mess up as much as David did and as badly as David did and still be a man after God's own heart? If you read the Psalms, you see these moments when David is just like, it's almost like he's fighting against God. But if you notice, in every one of those passages, in every single Psalm that he seems to be pushing back on God, he ends it with gratitude towards God. There's something about being grateful that should, should launch everything else in our lives. There should be something about gratitude and being grateful that, that should stir something in us. And David understood, and understood that. See, David's life, the way it began, he was just a shepherd boy. He was one of a group of brothers. And, and he didn't get invited to the, the meeting. Samuel, this guy, is coming to different families looking for the next king. And guess what David is relegated to? You go watch the sheep because you're really not going to be a mountain to much more than that. Your older brothers, they look more like king material. So David doesn't even, doesn't even get to show up at first. In fact, he's, Samuel finally says, get the other brother, let's check him out. Go get David. David gets accepted as the next king. Okay, that's pretty cool. But, but what happens after that? He's just, he, just, he becomes DoorDash Uber Eats for his brothers as they're off to war fighting the Philistines. He's just running them food back and forth. 
He doesn't get to do anything. He's, he's, he's not that big of a deal. And then he sees God being persecuted, being pushed back against, and nobody's standing up for God. And so he decides he's going to stand up for God, and he goes to the king and says, I'll stand up for God. I'll fight the giant. And what does the king do? Yeah, you're not, you're not going to be able to last at all. Here, here, take my armor, armor that's way too big for him. What does he do? He throws off the armor and goes out there and fights a giant with rocks. See, everything David did, it didn't seem like he was going to be amounting to much. And then, as he got an opportunity to be before the king, he spends the next few years of his life trying to serve this king that's trying to kill him. David becomes king. You think he's, got, he's finally arrived, right? Nope. Guess what he does? He commits adultery with the woman that's married, gets her pregnant, and then puts out a hit on her husband, who is one of the most loyal men in his army, most loyal men to him, and he kills him. David was messed up. He, he didn't have it all figured out. In fact, his firstborn son dies. A son later on tries to kill him and take the throne from him. His family is a mess. And yet David is a man after God's own heart. How can a messed up, disregarded, unassuming, ratty shepherd boy have anything to be grateful for? Well, I think there's a, there's a, there's a process here. And if you have your Bibles, turn over to Psalm chapter 9. Eddie shared this with you. Look at Psalm chapter 9. Because when, when David writes this, he's king. But there's, more than likely, there's not a whole lot going right for him. It's, it's not all easy. And, and maybe this is a grateful moment for him, but more than likely, he's struggling. He's struggling with dealing with people that are just sinners, just like him. And he's wrestling. But he understands something, that, that for us to truly be grateful, we need to be grateful for the past because that, grateful of, uh, that gratitude of the past builds hope on what God has for the future. And so he does something very interesting in the first two verses of Psalm chapter nine. He, he unpacks for us four I wills because he understands that gratitude is an attitude, it's a choice you choose. It's not just something that just happens and it makes you feel good and, and all of a sudden you can just be thankful. He re- recognizes that gratitude isn't, isn't a feeling. It's a response to reality. And so David gives us the ingredients for joy in four quick, easy verses. Or two verses with four quick, easy ingredients. Look at this. Four I wills. The first one. I will thank the Lord with all my heart. Let me put it this way in your notes if you want to fill it out. I will passionately thank God. I will passionately, with my whole heart, I will thank God. That's what David says. This isn't a feeling. It's not a random urge that just kind of springs on him and it just comes out. This is an I will use my, this is a, this is a statement of I will use my will, my actions, my, I will even, even disregard some of my feelings if I need to. I will make it, I will do everything I can to thank God with everything I've got even when I don't feel it. See, passionate gratitude takes intention. It's not an accident. A thankful heart becomes a content heart, and a content heart will rejoice, and David understands that. He goes on in the second one. He says, I will, uh, I will willfully declare God's greatness. Look at verse two, the second part of that. I will declare all your wondrous works. I think... Um, I think it's incredibly dangerous. I think it's incredibly dangerous for us when we lose the awe of God. Because when we stop having an awe for God, we replace it with the awe of ourselves. And as soon as we start forgetting how awesome God is, I know we talk about that we shouldn't be afraid of God. I think we should have a little bit more of a fear of God than what we do because that fear draws us to an awe of God of understanding who he really is and what he saved us from. And as soon as that begins to be diminished, we start to elevate how great we are. And so David, and he had plenty of these moments where he forgot how great God was and he had to try to find ways to remind himself. He pens this for a choir director to sing 
to, to turn into a song that would be sung within the courts so that David would remember the awesomeness of God, to be grateful to God, but also for anyone who heard to remind, remind them of who God was. You see, there's all kinds of things in this world around you and I that are trying to replace the, the awe of God with other things. That shiny new thing, that next thing, that relationship, this moment, this job. It's all about those things. And, and very quickly, we forget how awesome God is and what he's done for us. We have to consciously and loudly remind ourselves of God's greatness. Our affirmations of God's greatness must be louder than the world's distractions. And you're gonna be distracted this week. You're gonna be distracted this afternoon as you're watching a football game cheering for a team, as you're going shopping over the next few weeks, as you're scrambling to get all the right ingredients for, for your Thanksgiving dinner, you're gonna get distracted from the awesomeness of God. Third one, third I will, starting in verse two. I will rejoice and boast about you. I will trump, triumphantly rejoice in God. If you want to have true joy, you begin by rejoicing, you, 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 by, by the third thing of rejoicing in who God is. See, on this side of the cross, we get that Jesus died on the cross and he's triumphant over sin and death. But David doesn't have that perspective right now. And yet he still says, I'm gonna rejoice in God. It's, it's this yielding of his will to God's will. It's not about him anymore. The, the previous two I wills have kind of set the stage for this one. When you look at it, he, he says, I'm gonna thank the Lord with all my heart. I'm gonna declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you. Here's the question. What is worth rejoicing in more than what God has done and promises to do? Maybe, maybe God didn't give you what you wanted at the time. Maybe God didn't help when you wanted help, or at least you didn't think he was helping. Maybe, maybe God didn't show up the way you wanted him to show up. But when you are you're pushing your heart to willfully and purposefully thank God and rejoice in God, something begins to stir differently. There's a different kind of peace that starts to stir inside of you that replaces the anger and, and the frustration. And it doesn't become about your will anymore, it becomes about what God is doing. And let's start with this. Jesus died on the cross for you. He didn't have to do that. But he wanted to do that so you could have a relationship with him. And so we can triumphantly rejoice in God. What else do we need to rejoice in other than what God has done and what he's promised to do? And number four, the last one. I will sing about your name most high. And we've done this this morning. I will sing, I will openly sing to God. Now, I get it, for some of us, we can't wait for an opportunity to sing. For others of us, it's like a cow transitioning into a seagull, and it's just awful, and it's an awful sound, and so we're like, I'm not gonna sing, nobody wants to hear that sound. And I get it, but isn't it true? Isn't it true that there are these moments when something stirs inside of you that you just can't help but sing? And sometimes it's in the car when nobody's around. Sometimes it's in the shower when you think nobody's listening. Sometimes it's when you're all by yourself. But there's something inside of you, there's these moments that stir inside of you that you just, you gotta just let it out. And, and maybe those are few and far between. But there's something about that. And, and David understood the power of our voices praising God openly. You see, David here is portraying a bending of my fear, my insecurity, my insufficiency, and openly laying my heart and actions at the feet of God through verbal and maybe even out of tune music, words, expressions back towards God about the greatness of God and the gratitude of my heart. You see, it all builds together just like the perfect ingredients into a banana cream pie. You do one out of order, you do one before the other. If you try to put the pudding in before the, the pie crust, you're gonna have upside down pie cake. But, it, but when you start to put it all together, God does something with that. The Spirit does something inside of us and begins to stir up peace. Some of the best songs we will ever sing are simple prayers from our hearts. And as soon as we start trying to point out 
how other people are messing up, how other people aren't measuring up, how other people drive us crazy. We have taken our eyes off of the awe of God and we're looking at the awe of the moment or of that individual. And so we have to intentionally find these moments to passionately thank God, willfully declare his greatness, triumphantly rejoice in God, and openly sing to God. We do that every Sunday. You might do that in the car on Monday. But we need to find those moments to do that. Some of the best songs we will ever sing are simple prayers from a grateful heart. So over the next few weeks, we want to be talking and we want to be looking at stories of individuals throughout the Bible, and even maybe throughout our experiences that, that, have, that have shown us what peace and joy can look like. And one of the ingredients to peace and joy is a grateful prayer and a gracious surrender to trust God. You might want to write that down. One of the key ingredients to peace and joy is grateful prayer and gracious surrender to trust God. So how do we do that? Well, let me give you two really simple things that we're gonna practice this month, that we're gonna practice together. And you'd think that maybe uh, Eddie and I or Charles and I talked this week. We didn't. But the first one is prayer. Prayer. We need to pray. We need to be praying to God. We need to make it a practice. We need to make it a habit in our lives. And that, it's interesting how the Spirit works through different minds, different, uh, different voices, and, and it all comes together in this one moment that apparently what the Spirit is telling us right now is that we need to practice prayer this month. So I'm gonna challenge you to practice it five minutes a day. If you can do more, great, but start with five minutes a day. Maybe you think it's kind of a weird thing and you've never done it before. Uh, I, I know some people have said, well, think of it as a conversation between you and somebody that you really like. And I think that's a good place to start. But let me, give you, let me give you four things that you can do when you pray to God. And I think these are important because we need to understand something. There's two sides of this. On one side, God is our friend. On the other side, he's not. On one side, God loves us. On the other side, he's judging us. And, and he's our judge. On one side, he has provided forgiveness for us. On the other side, unless we accept it, we, we don't get to experience his forgiveness even though he's still giving it to us. And so I think we need to honor God in, in the right way. And so yes, we can talk to him as our friend, but we also need to talk to him as God. Let me give you four ways to do that. And it's just the letters A-C-T-S, Acts. The first thing we do is acknowledge characteristics about God. Acknowledge some characteristics, two or three characteristics. What do you know about God? When you go to talk to God, say, what do you want to start with and, and, and acknowledge of characteristics of him? He's holy, he's just, he's loving, he's kind. Acknowledge that. Tell him that. Second, C, confess. Confess what separates you from God. You know. You know the things that you're doing and the things that you're struggling with and the things that you're wrestling with that, that, that pull you away from God. Confess those things openly to him. T, thank God for what he's done for you. This might take some work. It might have to start with, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for me. It might have to just start with that, and that's as far as you can get, because right now, you're feeling like he hasn't done much for you. But the more that you practice this, and the more that you wrestle with this, and the more that you take time to maybe even journal or write down, uh, get, a, get a notebook or something, write down the things as you think back, how, when has God shown up in your life? It might be a small list at first, but the more you do it, the more you're gonna see God at work in your heart. So acknowledge, confess, thank, and then the last one, share your concerns and struggles with God. End it with sharing your concerns and, and, and sharing the, the, the struggles that you have. Maybe you wanna pray for people. That's a great way to, to, to talk to God is to pray for the people in your life that one, you appreciate what he's done, and, but, but you, you just want, you want this person to be okay. You want them to to. to, to to flourish, to, to grow. You want them to, to be okay, to be healthy. That's okay, to pr pray that to God. So the first one is pray, and the second one is remember. I think sometimes we forget. We forget the awesomeness of God, and one of the best ways to remember is to memorize scripture. And so we're gonna do a little challenge because every single one of us, and I will prove this this month, every single one of us can memorize scripture. Every single one of us, what's two plus two? Four, thank you, thank you for the answer. No one answered. Uh, 
Two plus two is four. We had to remember that at some point. If I started throwing lyrics of a popular song out here, I bet that most of you would probably go, oh, I know that song, and you'd know the lyrics. We need to memorize scripture, and so I'm gonna challenge us to do this. Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven. Let's just memorize those two verses for the month. Let's start there. We got one more that we're gonna do that's really simple. We'll look at it next week. But, but start this week and just read Philippians 4, 6 and 7, two or three times a day. And next Sunday, we're gonna repeat it together. And the next Sunday, we'll repeat it together. And the next Sunday, we'll repeat it together. I'm pretty sure at the end of the month, you're gonna remember the verse. And it's in those moments when you least feel grateful that when you memorize something, you'll remember something. And when you remember something, it directs you the right way. And so in that moment when Aunt Sally is driving you nuts, you'll be able to step back and you go, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And that's verse four. But, but you'll start to remember God's word and it will change you. Next week, we're going to look at a a couple stories of two women in the Bible. Two women who practiced prayer and had memorized scripture, and we're going to see how it changed their situation. And they were in difficult, awful situations. Society was not looking very well at them. If there is a way to be uh, socially outcast, they were experiencing it. And we're going to look at their story. But, but I want to end with something. We're going to end with a song that we already sang before. We're going to do the song, uh, Come Thou Fount. And there's a very interesting phrase in that. Um, and, and, and it says, I raise my Ebenezer. In the, in the Bible, uh, or, or when, when the guy wrote, the, when the, the individual wrote this passage, he was thinking about these moments in the Bible when there were these different stones raised up to remember God. But an Ebenezer is just a fancy way of saying a stone of help. It's these, and what he was saying is basically there's these moments when I need help from God and, I, and people at his time would, would build these stone structures in response to saying, God, I need help and letting the people around them know that they needed help. And so this idea of raising our Ebenezer is this, God, I'm getting ready to go through a moment when I'm gonna need help and I'm gonna need a reminder that you're there, that you're near, that you're with me. I'm gonna need to remember to pray. I'm gonna need to remember to remember my verse or the the scripture. I'm gonna need you. I need you near because I want to rejoice, but I know that there's a moment when I'm not gonna want to. There's coming a time in the next few weeks when I'm gonna feel exhausted and I don't feel joy and I don't feel peace. God, I need you near. And so I'm gonna raise this moment to remember who you are. I need your help. And so as we sing this, and the reason why I asked the guys to do it again is I heard something. I heard our voices in a way that just was like, it it wasn't just because it was a song that we knew, there was this part of us that was stirring inside of us that, that this was a cry from our heart, that I want the fountain of God's blessing in my life. I don't want God just give me a, a, an old Texas, oh bless your heart. No, I want his blessing in my life right now and I need it and I need this fountain to flow in me because right now I'm afraid I'm not feeling it. And so if you are struggling, we want to pray with you, we want to encourage you, but I want to encourage all of us that this is our opportunity to respond to what God has already been stirring in us. And maybe this is a moment when you're raising your Ebenezer. Maybe this is a moment when you're going, (laughs) it's hard to rejoice right now. Let's sing openly to God.